So glad you could join with us as we gather around the throne of grace. And uh, can you hear me with that going on? You get used to it after a while, don't you? Um, I think it's still pumping out heat. Just to mention a few things and then we'll go on to uh, open the word. And a few things are, a couple of things there. One is the gift day. Uh, I believe that's coming up. Just to say, we, we had our gift days the last two Sundays. Uh, and I know some of you would have put cards and say, yep, I, I owe you. Or we'll put something down. Uh, just be aware of that. Please get ready to redeem those. Uh, but they've been really wonderful days, wonderful Sundays. Those are the three causes, just to remind you again. Uh, Ukraine, obviously, we want to be able to give in to that. Those who are really struggling in ways that um, none of us have ever experienced. Many, many people who are just needing help. Well, we know many in our family of churches and other churches are working strongly into Ukraine right now. We want to be able to bless and give where we can. So that's one cause. The other is uh, Home for All, Jan and Marianne, what they're doing for pre, um, early stage <laughs> dementia. Oh, man. Book me in. Video clip, that video clip, and, they, and they, he put me in the last shot there. <laughs> Yarn, you are such a monkey. But uh, what a wonderful, wonderful cause. And uh, look, I can't think of a better one because we're giving to folks who cannot give back, who are truly vulnerable. And there are many, many situations, families who are struggling with those who have that kind of situation among them. We get to bless and to be the heart of God. And what Yarn and Mariana are doing giving hope again and value to people who feel unvalued. Man, that is the heart of God. So that was the other cause. And Kapari, of course, as well. You know, it takes finance to help with that site up there, up the coast. And uh, again, that's so that not we just let's have a lovely time up there, but that they reach out and share the heart of God with those in need there. So wonderful causes. Just to keep reminding you of those. I know some of you are away or have just been reconnecting online or however it's been. Uh, then honestly, uh, it's, these are wonderful causes. Those of you who are online now, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you could join us. So glad you could be here. Hope you're feeling part of what we're doing. Um, so that's that. Second thing is the prayer feedback. Just to say we kind of had these prayer times during the week, various times, uh, and they were a real success actually. So we had three times during the week at various times. And we just want to try and, we, we know that it's a good thing, we just want to try and hone those times now to where people want to have them. So some of you have been feeding back, oh, I can't do that time, but I like this kind of time. Please keep doing that through email or tapping uh, us on the shoulder. Then, look, we want to hear that. We can't promise we'll get what you want, you know, 10.30 p.m. between the news and the, the, the late night film. I, I, we can't do that. But, uh, look, we're wanting to just genuinely have uh, up the, the times of prayer among us as a people. So please get back to us. It's that. And uh, I think that may well be it, so wonderful. So now we get to continue really to get close to the end of the series that we've been doing, the Gospel of Mark, and that's been great fun, and uh, I trust you got a lot out of it. And Matty P is going to come open the word to us, so I want us to put our hands together for Matt, a wonderful gift teacher. Let's receive all that he's got, shall we? Hands together, Matt. Go, Matt. So when the kids go to bed, all of a sudden there's silence and quiet. <laughs> you can hear me right, just testing. Sound alright? Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai hāri mai, uh, ko Matt uh, tōku ingoa. Um, yeah, it's always a real, real privilege to, to preach after a worship like that, you know. It's just, it's just low today. And I'm going to shuffle a few things around a little bit and see how... See how we go on the back of it. But yeah, we, we are in our... Um, in the ...been really stirred and shaped by this. As we've looked at um, discipleship, you know, this costly call to, to follow Jesus. What does that, what does that look like? 
I think it's been really refreshing in our, uh, in our sort of current climate at the moment. So we are looking at um, uh, our passage today, which is Mark chapter 15. Uh, there we go, Mark 15 verse, uh, from verse 40 onwards. And so if you've got your Bibles, um, open them up and, and get, get turning to that. Um, but just, just to set the scene for, uh, for this passage, the, um, the, back, the backdrop to this, this story about the empty tomb is, of course, um, that Jesus has just been, been crucified. And I think it's important just to sometimes pause between the crucifixion and the resurrection and just realize this was, I mean, this was a, this was a dark day, wasn't it? I mean, this was not, you know, a box of fluffies out of which the resurrection emerges. This is, this is soul-piercing darkness. In fact, um, uh, someone uh, prophesied to, to Mary when Jesus was just a baby, there's going to come a day where a sword will pierce your own soul. And that was, that was um, Simeon's warning to, to Mary about Jesus' vocation as the Son of God. And this is, it's actually out of this darkness, you know, the most sort of tragic moment, you might say, in the disciples' lives, that the resurrection story, uh, the light of that shines forth. And it's, uh, it's quite a sombering sort of moment when you think about it. So what we're going to do with that in mind is just walk through the story um, now. So uh, it's not, the words aren't going to be up on the screen, so I want you to grab your Bibles and follow along. And I've got some pictures on the screen as a bit of a visual aid, so a um, bit of involvement today. So some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate, the Roman governor, and asked him for Jesus' body. And you've got to remember, this is the same council that has just condemned Jesus to death. And Joseph himself was a disciple in secret because he, he, um, he feared the people. Uh, so this was a bold move for him to, to, um, to do. And Pilate was quite surprised to hear that Jesus had already died. And so summoning the centurion, he asked him, has Jesus already died? I guess the other thing to note as well at this moment is a Roman centurion is more or less a professional killer. You know, it's, it's their vocation. And Rome crucified so many people that this was just like another day at the office for them. You know, this was like Thermosash putting another curtain wall window in on a Tuesday. You know, for him, this was just another day at the office. And he was ruthlessly efficient. So, yep, he found out that Jesus had in fact died. And uh, he learned from the centurion that it was so. And he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. And, and elsewhere we, we learn that it's actually Joseph's own tomb that he had um, given to Jesus to lay uh, in there. He rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb, and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. Just pause there for a moment. And just think about it on that day. The sun is setting. It's the worst, most grievous day of their life. I mean, their hopes are dashed. This is not an oh, happy day. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not writing that song in this moment. This is agony and tears. And anyone who has been through unexpected grief can empathize something of the wake, that, of the emotion that these uh, these women were, and, and others were feeling. I mean, they were in shock. They would have been inconsolable. They would have been feeling very fearful and very, very vulnerable. Tears in their face. I mean, like, and then the next day, they just have to sit and kind of do nothing because it's the Sabbath. And in their, in their law, that was a day of, of rest. And so it's in this, in this state that they make their way to the tomb to... Um, anoint Jesus' body with spices. And you kind of get this, this feeling that, like, 
They're a little bit aimless, that they're feeling lost. They're just kind of going through the motions that people who are facing severe grief will, will be going through. They'll just, you know, do the housework or oh, I'm just going to go and do this. And so they go and um, do this sort of duty. And so the, our story carries on. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they may go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But as they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Forget talk of angels and resurrection narratives and things like that. I mean, just think how, how perplexing this would have been for them. The, the thoughts that were swirling through their mind. It's like they went, hang on, the stones rolled away. And then there's a young man. They go into the tomb and it's like, that would give me a heck of a fright. But there's a young man. They don't say angel because they don't recognize him as that. It's just a young man sitting in there in the tomb, you know? And that would have been like... Where is he? What have you done with him? Where have you taken him? Who is this man? And he says to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He was crucified. He's risen. See the place. Have a look. This is where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples he's going ahead of you. And then jumping to that verse 8, it says, Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. It kind of reminds you of the disciples in the boat. You know, Jesus speaks to the storm and, 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 and the storm calms down and then the disciples are bewildered and terrified. It's like, it's a similar kind of reaction. Like, who is this guy? And, and I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of myself in this position and it's like the categories of my mind are blowing. You know, my mental fuses are popping. It's not just that like something amazing has happened in my ability to think. It's just like, it's next level stuff, you know what I mean? It's just, it's blowing my whole mind. It's like, hang on, he's alive? He's coming? What? What is this? I mean, I had big hopes for Jesus, but coming back from the dead? I mean, like, I have no idea what's going on right now. And then other than an extra ending at the end of Mark that was most certainly at a later date, Mark's gospel finishes. It's a cliffhanger, eh? Now, I, I love reading books to my kids at night, and I pride myself in a good cliffhanger. It might not be the end of the chapter, sometimes it's halfway through, but I love a good cliffhanger for my kids. And the reason I love it is it keeps them coming back for more, and it keeps them engaged in the story, and they go, oh, Dad, no, you can't stop there. And when they go to bed, it's like their mind is racing as to all the implications of what's just happened. And often it gets their imagination bubbling as to, what does that mean for me? And some scholars say, oh, there was a back page of Mark and it got a bit dusty and fell out the back. And others say, well, actually, Mark intended to finish in this way in order to create a bit of a suspended ending of, that gets you thinking, of, what does this mean for me? So, and that's where Mark ends. So we're going to have a look at a little bit of the significance at the moment. But one thing I love about Mark's account here is how heavily it features characters. You know, we all love our favorite TV shows, you know. I don't know what you're watching at the moment. Maybe you want to share it, maybe you don't. But um, we love our characters, and the reason is we love to see them, how they progress. You know, and the best movies allow the characters to, to grow and develop in the plot line, don't they? We love a good character, so does Mark. Mary, Mary, uh, another Mary, and Salome, Joseph. What, and what's happening in, in, in Mark's account here is he's, he's not just telling, a, 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 you know, he's not just factually retelling a series of events. A happened, then B happened, then C happened. Now what he's doing is he's taking these characters and he is, he's enabling us to see like the shockwave and the impact of what happens when this amazing story Thing, the resurrection happens in their life. And what we get to see in their life is that this moment of the empty tomb is transformational for these characters, as it should be for in, in our life as a disciple as well. 
And uh, so just to unpack this a bit more, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a director of a nature documentary film. All right, just go there, with there. Go there for a moment with me, right? And, and it's your job to, to film a wave, you know, maybe somewhere out there in the ocean. And what could you do as a director? I mean, you could grab a drone and, and you could just sort of like get it to follow this wave and just, you know, wave in the middle of the ocean, you know, and that's kind of the shot. Or what you could do is to take a beach maybe, a lighthouse, a, a coastal cliff, and film the moment that the wave boom, crashes into this object. And you would learn something about the wave just by looking at this object, keep your eyes on the object, and then boom, the wave crashes into it. And it's like you can learn something of the bigger event that's happening. You'll never get a full glimpse of how powerful this wave is and you know, how much energy is in it, whatever. But you'll see something of the moment in this ordinary, everyday thing when the wave comes in. And when it comes in, you bet that this little object is going to be transformed. It's going to be a pivotal moment for that. And what I love about Mark's retelling of the story is he just takes ordinary characters, you know, the tenth Mary in the gospel, you know, uh, you know another Joseph, you know, it's like, my goodness. Uh, and, he, and boom, the resurrection crashes in on them. And it's a pivotal moment for them. And I find that really refreshing because for you and me, Hey, we're just everyday, uh, unassuming, ordinary people. And the call is to let the power of the empty tomb and the resurrection bring transformation in your life and let it be a pivotal moment. And so you can enter into the story and be like, wow, this has, this has an implication for me. God is calling the empty tomb to have an impact in my life as a disciple. I love that. I love it. Now, just to expand on this image a little bit more, as I was praying for this preach, uh, I saw an image of a, a, a large stride, like someone taking a giant step. And as this wave is crashing in, it's like as a disciple, we are called to step out of certain things and into better things, into other things. It's a moment of transformation. For example, we are called to step out of fear. And we're called to step through that into great courage, and witness. And we see that, uh, we'll see that in a moment as well. Or where it's called to step out of, as this big wave looms on us ordinary characters, we are called to step out of silence and into bold witness to the resurrection. The tomb is empty. It's good, hey? So, what I want to do now that I've set that up is look at a couple of characters, Joseph and, and the woman, and just see what do they step out of and what do they step into, because I think there's some important discipleship lessons. And I'm going to jump a couple of points, because I feel on the back of our worship time, I just want to highlight one in particular, and whatever I get time after that is a bit of a bonus, okay? So we'll see how this goes. So let's start with um, Mary, Mary, and Salome. Skimming down on my notes a bit here. Here we go. Let's look at these three women. What can we learn from them? What do they step out of and what do they step into as they encounter the empty tomb? Well, I think they step out of the unassuming. And that's, uh, there's a lot in that word. So let me just unpack what I mean by that a little bit more. By unassuming, I, I, I mean silence. I mean an insignificance. Uh, I mean being hemmed in by cultural expectations or roles. I mean, watching from a distance. Mark actually says he has them watching from a distance. It's being on the sideline. It's being unassuming. And they step into, off the sideline, and into front and center stage of incredible witness that the tomb is empty. Now, it's fair enough to say that Mark ends on a cliffhanger as to whether the women actually do go and witness in that way. But the point is it's that's the empty tomb that's pushing them and thrusting them forward to say, you go, you go, get off the sideline. Stop being unassuming. This is a really big deal. He's alive. Let's think about their encounter for a little bit. They take spices, which are basically to, as I understand it, to kind of, you know, stop the bad smell. 
and they take, uh, they take those to anoint Jesus' body for burial. But what they haven't realized is that another woman has already done that days before by pouring uh, perfume on Jesus' feet. He's already been anointed for burial. And they need to catch up with the events of the kingdom arriving, what this big wave actually means for them. They needed to catch up with their role in the coming kingdom. And my challenge is, you may need to catch up with your role in all of this as well. You see, these women had, had seen, like first-hand seen. Mark has them watching at the cross. They see where he was laid. They see the stone rolled away and the empty tomb and the man sitting there. They see it, they see it, they see it. In fact, one writer says, um, the way that the uh, Gospels repeatedly make the woman the subjects of verbs of seeing, in other words, in the Greek, like partnering the woman with the verb to see, clearly shows that the Gospels are appealing to their role as eyewitnesses. You see, Jesus didn't need their spices. He needed their witness. You know what I mean? It's like, lay that down. This is what's actually happening. And, and an un they're like this unassuming woman. They're like, oh, hang on. Put that down. I'm off. I love this. This guy, Richard Bork, I'm reading a book of his at the moment called A Study of uh, the Named Woman in the New, in the New Test in the Gospels. And it's just getting a lot out of it, really. And he, he goes on to say, for the woman, faithfulness to loved ones through shame and death is a culturally expected role. But their encounter is, uh, transforms their faithfulness into something more than their accepted cultural role. The vocation to be witnesses of a world-transforming event. It's like, wow, as Jesus followers, as disciples, as a church, as men and as women, we need to realize there is no sideline Jesus is calling you to hang out on, to watch from a distance from. No, as unassuming as you may feel at times, you are front and center of what God is doing in this land. Step out of feeling unassuming and step into amazing witness, bold witness. This is what we're called to do at the empty tomb. See, you know, show of hands for who feels unassuming at times, you know, it's like, everybody, <laughs> you know. There are people who will not hear and see, who will not encounter the gospel, unless this small group of disciples in this room play our part and step out of feeling unassuming and into the next season of significance. It's like, what are we waiting for? What are, what are, I mean, that's a fair question. What are we waiting for? You know, more prominence, more numbers, more funds. I don't know, like, more louder band. I tell you, every one of those things is more than what those women needed to go and tell for the very first time that Jesus was alive. You know what I mean? Like, we have already more than what they had. Already more. We are called to go. It's good, eh? It's good. So we are called to step out of the unassuming. Now I'm going to bounce back now, because I think this next part from Joseph. Let's go to Joseph. What does that look like for us? What did, what did Joseph step out of and into? Well... I think he stepped out of a waiting for the kingdom and into an arrival of the kingdom. But I need to unpack that a little bit more. What I mean by that is that he was, he was waiting for the kingdom as he thought it should look like. You know what I mean? As a, as a, as a good Jewish God-fearing man, he was praying for the kingdom to come as well. But for him, that looked like military victory, end of taxation, you know, the fulfillment of God's promises, and the, like obedience of the nations to the Messiah. That's what he was expecting. I am waiting for this. Before I do anything, I'm waiting. He stepped out of that and into an engagement with Jesus' kingdom. And what did he step into there? He 
He stepped into a tomb. Do you know what I mean? He, he didn't step into prominence and wealth and, you know, like big flash. No, no, he stepped into a tomb. And it was there he learned what the kingdom arriving really looked like and really meant. So as we get stirred, yeah, 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 we can do this. We're not unassuming. What are we stepping into? A tomb. <laughs> Just a heads up, guys. Sorry. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I'm going to be like, you know, uh, you know, New Zealand's, you know, most prominent, amazing church and win all these awards and stuff like that. No, no, you're going to be stepping into a tomb, guys. This is what the empty tomb means. Let's unpack this a little bit more. Uh, Joe, uh, the, the, the passage here says that he was a prominent member of the council. I mean, this guy was honorable, reputable, wealthy, respected. And, uh, you know, so he was, a, he was a pretty up there guy. He was a high flyer, right? Had all this of things at his disposal. And what he did when he, he came to Pilate and said, can I have his body? I mean, that would have likely cost him something of his reputation with his peers. It would have been a sacrifice. He may have even get booted off the council. I don't know. But it would have been a bold thing for him to have done. At that moment, he realized he needed to lay down his expectations of what the kingdom looked like and embrace this otherly, upside-down kingdom, where to be first means to be last, where, you know, to be poor in spirit is to be blessed. Like it, he's like, oh, hang on, this is all upside down. I'm stepping into a tomb. <laughs> and so that is the challenge. We are stepping into, uh, into the kingdom, but not as what, as what we would expect, but from uh, what Jesus would expect from us. And so that's my question, that's my challenge, you know? Like, we no doubt have expectations of what God working in our life looks like. I mean, who's waiting for something in our life for God to act and move? Anybody? Who wants to sit? What does that look like? You have, you, therefore, you have an expectation. We have, I have an expectation. You have an expectation. Are we willing to lay that down and say, Lord, what does this look like in your kingdom? What do you want from me? You know? I thought I was going to be doing all of this. I thought I was going to be prominent, wealthy, you know, whatever, X, Y, and Z. But actually, Lord, what does it mean for, for, for me to step into your kingdom? But be ready, because it's costly. It might look like you stepping, it will look like you stepping into a tomb. Yeah? Working with the poor and needy. Working with, you know, the destitute. Working with the fringe, working with people that other people have written off. You know, this, is, this is what it will look like. That's where Jesus was. We need courage for this, eh? You can see the flow here. It's like, yeah, we're amped up. Oh, hang on, this is going to be costly. I need some courage. Cool, let's look at that next, all right? Joseph stepped out of silence and into courage, into boldness. You see, it was uh, John 19 says that um, he was a disciple in secret because of fear. So what do we do with that? We're like, yep, oh, oh hang on, wait, I'm scared. <laughs> what do we do now? We're called to step out of that fear. I love that famous Nelson Mandela quote that says, I learned courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph of over it. So in Christ, there's a way to triumph through our fear, maybe not to step beyond it, but actually to step through it and integrate courage. But how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, I want to propose we do it together. We do it together. We do it together. When you think of courage, who thinks of like William Wallace running lone, you know, into the fray you know, freedom, you know, it's like man alone, you know, who thinks of that when he thinks of courage, you know? Oh, I don't, I don't know if it's so much like that. I want to introduce you to another guy, his name is Nicodemus. Let's call him Nico, because that's a nice name. <laughs> now, um, Nico is a similar character to Joseph of Arimathea. He visits Jesus at night, he's a disciple in secret, and do you know what's really, really cool? John has Nico with Joseph together in the tomb, taking the body down from the cross and rolling it away. In other words, they're together. Like, they're both disciples in secret, and they're full of fear. 
And how do they get over that? They do it together. Like, courage is contagious. Who's ever seen something that you've, one of your closest friends or someone has done, you're like, ooh, ooh, maybe I can do this, you know? Unless it's something dangerous, like just be careful. Like don't jump off the cliff that your grandson's just jumped off or something like that, just, you know. But it's true, it, 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 it's, it's contagious. And I think this is really, really cool. And just as a, if you're interested, this, uh, I don't know, have you guys heard of The Chosen? I don't know, maybe I'm just late to the party. But, um, but I've been watching a few of these with the kids. And there's an episode where Nicodemus features heavily. And I was nearly in tears as, as this guy is like grappling with what it means to be a disciple as he, as he, as he visits Jesus in the night. And, 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 and you know, and the, the fear and the, oh, the what, oh, what does this mean? The grappling, will he, won't he? Well, the cool thing is the moment where he finally does, he's got Joseph of Arimathea with him, doing it with them together. Come on, guys, let's do this. I bet you they were geeing each other up. I bet you they were, like, punching each other in the arm. Should we do it? Should we do it? Should we do it? You know? And off they go. I bet you they were. So to be courageous is not to be alone. It's to be with others. You can't do this on your own. You need to be in community. You need to be plugged in, whether it be a small group or close friends or people that you do, you know, um, you know sharing a car ride with or WhatsApp groups or prayer. I, I challenge you to find out what it means for one of your closest friends to be courageous this week and encourage them in that. You know, rather than focus on you, what do I need to do? You know, like, we all, need, we all do that, but it's like, well, hang on, what, is, what does it mean for my buddy to be courageous this week? I'm going to encourage him, you know. He's going to be the Nico to my Joseph, you know. Like, it's, um, let's, let's do that, all right? Let's do it together. Let's do it together. All right, so they stepped out of silence and fear and into bold, uh, into bold witness. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I had one more point, but I think that's probably a preach for another day. Um, so I'll skip that point there. And what I want to do now is talk about the last, the last character, which is you. <laughs> Which is you. You see, the way Mark ends invites you to realize that you are part of the resurrection narrative. I mean, all the people that we're reading about, their time is gone. You know, they're in glory. Now it's you, you know. It's, it's you. You are in this fulfillment of the ending of Mark that just kind of drops off the cliff. All right, it's, it's us, it's you, it's me. And I just want to encourage you really to, to reflect on that. <coughs> they had to face up to, and we have to face up to the news that the kingdom has crash landed among us and it's called to be a transformational moment. And now we are involved in the story. We are the Josephs, we are the Marys in Porirua, in Upper Hutt, in, in Wellington, you know, in Porirua, like in these places, this is, I want you to see yourself in the story because you are no more or less unassuming than these ordinary characters that we're reading about who just sort of all of a sudden found themselves center stage with like world history playing out in, in real time in front of them. That's us right now, nothing less. And so my question is, what do you need to step out of and what do you need to step into uh, as you contemplate the empty tomb? Will you allow it to propel you forward and to step into boldness, both individually and like we've been talking about, together as well? And will you witness to Jesus' kingdom and allow this to be a transformational, pivotal moment in your life? This is my cliffhanger. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Let's stand. Yeah, Lord, thank you for this morning and just the way your spirit's been moving and stirring us and 
stirring us even before get up and say a word lord you're you're stirring our hearts that we're looking at a new day lord you're stirring our hearts that it's there's these fresh things that you're calling us into and father i thank you that you're calling us into your kingdom you're yeah. you're calling us into the ways of your son and your, the upside down nature of, of your love as it's revealed into the world lord and father i thank you that you're calling us to step into what you've got for us lord you have set us apart before the creation of the world you have you haven't set us aside lord you've set us apart for your glory and for the benefit of those around us lord we acknowledge we're yeah we're just feeling tired and flat lord, we feel like you know something that those ladies felt on that day but it didn't stop you from breaking into their reality and ushering them into a new new thing lord, we want to lay down our spices we want to lay down the things that are out of time out of step with you and we want to step in with great boldness and courage into everything that you've got for us, Lord, in our community. Lord, like we've been singing, light a fire in our hearts, Lord, for the sake of Porirua, for the sake of Wellington and the Hutt Valley and beyond the Carpety Coast and beyond, Lord. Lord, light a fire in us that we would um, carry the mantle, Lord, that we would um, bring that. And I just pray for courage, Lord, and pray that you'd really be speaking by the Spirit. Lord, to step out of old realities and old ways of thinking and to step into courage and boldness and purpose in Jesus' name. Yeah. Speak to our hearts in these days. Amen.